So I'm going to be talking about dynamic GORM. So this is kind of another sort of mixed bag talk like I've done a few times before and I've done a couple times here. So it's a bunch of small topics that, um, that I find interesting that... Um, yes, okay, I will speak more slowly and I will try to enunciate more clearly because even native English speakers quite often have a hard time understanding what the hell I'm saying. Puedo hablar en español? Español? Uh, okay, so um, small topics, interesting stuff. And in this talk, there are two things that I've done, two problems that I've solved that are not big problems, not huge things, but that have been nagging at me for y literally years that I finally have solutions to these problems, so I'm very excited about those. So it's, the original idea was you know, the, doing dynamic things in GORM, and it, I, I kind of diverged a bit from that. Um, so what I was thinking was, you know, there's a massive amount of functionality in GORM and there's so much cool stuff that you can do and most everything you would want to do in a database or in a data store, Mongo, Redis, Postgres, whatever, is available to you. But there are also, if you know kind of how things work and, and what um, features are available sort of under the hood, there are more uh, creative ways that you can use GORM to kind of go around, the, go underneath and go, be, go you know, and do some interesting things. So there's some of that, but there's also some more just, I think, fun and interesting GORM things. So I'm currently working at Agile Orbit, which is a small consultancy in Minneapolis. And so they're, uh, they don't run great conf in, in, uh, in the US, but they're affiliated with that and, and a great bunch of guys. And a lot of the work that, a lot of the things that I've been doing that uh, kind of inspired this talk have been because I've been doing a lot of framework type stuff for a lot of years, you know, working for the Grails team and then working on plugins. And I'm back working, doing consulting and, and doing project work. So I'm doing real Grails work, you know, the sort of stuff that, you know, n you normal people do on a regular basis. And um, so I've, I've, I keep seeing these things. And so a lot of the ideas that are in this talk are coming from the really fascinating work that I've been doing for some clients. And in addition, we're going to be doing some open sourcing of some stuff that I'll be talking about here too. So, so a few weeks ago, I did a. Uh, I started actually working on this talk, and I was doing some notes for the slides. And the way that I was structuring it, it sort of felt like you know almost like a blog post. So I was thinking, well, why don't I sort of write a blog post so that I can maybe flesh out the ideas early early on? And so I did that. I have a link here in the slides, and I'll make the slides available later on. And uh, maybe you, some of you might have seen that. So I was working on, so a few months ago, back in November, December, I had a big productivity boost where I had been not ignoring, but kind of too busy to work on the Spring Security plugins. And there was a lot of, I mean, I got the, the new Grail 3 plugins out and kind of working, but they still needed a lot of work. So I, I, d I spent maybe two full months just really working on almost nothing but those plugins and I finally got them to the point where we had the 2.0 GA release and the 3.0 GA release. And um, so we're finally at you know stable versions and there's still work to do, there's still bugs out there, but uh, we finally got to uh, away from the, you know, the release candidate stage. And one of the things that I was working on in the UI plugin was so I had written the original queries mostly in HQL. I really like HQL. It, I, it's very readable to me. It's very natural to me because it reads to me like SQL, like SQL. And, you know, GORM has so many different ways that you can query. There's dynamic finders. There's, of course, HQL if you're using Hibernate. There's uh, criteria queries. There's the new where queries that are really great. And, and so there's lots of options there. And criteria, the where queries are relatively new. I really like those. But criteria queries are, I think, for most people, tend to use those. And they've always kind of... I don't think bothered me is the right word to use, but I didn't really sort of get them. I didn't really understand them. I didn't feel as comfortable using them. So um, quite often I would just use HQL instead, but that doesn't work in Mongo. It doesn't work in Redis. It doesn't work in any other database except a relational database. So someone contributed a pull request and converted all those search queries to criteria queries, which is great. And I, I really appreciate that that, that, that that guy took the time to do that. But one of the things, one of the queries was a little strange and a little bit more complex than the rest. And the way that it ended up, it was like, I sort of created a, almost a DSL, a querying DSL in the, in, the, uh, in the UI plugin. It wasn't intentional, it was just, I kind of wanted to push as much stuff into the base class and kind of have a very simple querying API. 
And it, it wasn't consistent with the rest of the pattern, the, re the programming pattern. So I wanted to kind of make it more generic and make it more in line with the way that I was doing things in the plugin. So what I ended up doing was, um, so here's the original HQL. I was, so I was dynamically building up. You know how like with criteria queries, one of the, one of the fascinating things about criteria is, is that inside of that big closure, you can use ifs and you can use loops and you can use logic, right? So you can build up conditionally. You can say, if, the, if there's a parameter for this, then join in this table and add in this subcriteria. And if this happens, then do this. And then Gorm just takes care of all that and builds all the criterion objects and, and pulls it all together. And then when you run it, when you do the list or the get or the count or whatever, then it just does what you told it to do. And if you, did, if you coded it correctly, it, you know, magic happens. And you can do the same sort of thing with HQL. You can dynamically piece together strings of HQL like you would with SQL. Um, so that's what I was doing. So he converted this HQL to that uh, criteria projection. That's not that ugly, but I'm giving you a little bit of a peek into the way that my mind thinks. That, that sort of stuck out to me as kind of unnatural. So I was thinking, how could I say in a, a sort of a lightweight way to project into this class and then into this class and then arbitrarily deep and then at the very bottom apply this criterion, an equals or a greater than or a in list or something like that. So that was the problem that I created for myself that I didn't need to do, <laughs> certainly didn't need to do, but I had a lot of fun doing. So, um, so this is what the whole uh, qu query ended up becoming. So like I was saying, I have that sort of a DSL. So there's base class methods that give me all this stuff. So I look up the class. This is in a base class. So each class tells it what, um, each controller class tells it what domain class that it uses. So there's an ACL class controller that uses ACL class. There's a role class that uses role. Um, and so you can do all the other, the, the, the other standard criteria method calls. That's the standard query stuff. And then there's that ugly thing that I didn't like. So what I needed to then do is somehow figure out how does that work? How does ACL object identity drop down to ACL class, drop down to, drop down to, drop down to, and then equals whatever? How does that work? So I'm going to kind of, I'm going to try to, I'm going to actually sort of type this a little bit as I go. So, and I recommend that you um, read the blog post because I, I think I, I, I hopefully did that fairly clearly. So if you look at, at this, right? Where's my mouse? I have no mouse. Huh. I've lost control of my computer. So is that fairly readable? All right, so let's do that. So this is that projection that I was looking at. So what's going on here? This is Groovy code, right? Any DSL, and this is a DSL, any DSL in Groovy, for within reason, you know, unless you're doing some really strange sort of uh, ASD transformation sort of stuff, this has to be executable Groovy code. And it is. So in order for this to be executable Groovy code, what must be happening is that there must be a method call called ACL object identity. This is a class name with, you know, with a lowercase first letter. And then we've got a closure, right? We all recognize closures, it's braces with stuff in the middle. And then inside of that closure, we have another method call, again with a closure as its body. And then we've got a, a method call equals uh, with two parameters, a string and a long. So it's a little bit more clear if we put the parentheses that we omitted back in. But by convention, and I certainly do this, um, we, we leave that stuff out and we, could, we, could, uh, we can do this too. Now it's a little bit more obvious that this is groovy code and we can even do absurd things like putting in semicolons. 
um, which is just bad. Um, all right, so let's take this further. So let me take this out. Let me remove that closure and then define it as a, as a variable. And the name doesn't matter, right? It's just a, just a local variable now. And then there's that. And I can do it again. <coughs> and I can take this closure, move it up here. And now I can kind of see that no matter how many levels deep we go, there's a pattern emerging, right? So this could have gone, this could have gone as many projection levels down as we wanted. And we can somehow figure out if we if we can do we can, if we can figure out for one level how to do it, then we can generic make that generic and do you know multiple levels. And at the innermost level, so I've kind of by inverting it, we're going backwards. So we're we're going f instead of we're going from the, the top down, but that's actually inside out. Um, at the innermost level, we've got this sort of expression, which I don't really have a good way to, of defining, but really the, there's this expression on the outside that's being run inside of here. So how to work with that? So let me make this a little bit more uh, concrete. So if I look at, I have a little project here and I'm gonna make all, all this code available online. So I've got, because right now I'm talking about ACL domain class stuff in the Spring Security uh, plugin, and I, I don't want to, you, you'd have to expect to, uh, to understand or care about uh, ACLs. Um, so let's make this a little bit more um, concrete. My machine is not awake. All right, so IntelliJ is not working with me here. Let me jump ahead and come back. I have lots more to talk about and I'll, I'll come back to this because I'm probably gonna run under anyway, so. All right, so we'll be back to that. So here's, a, here's another important idea. So how many of you are, are familiar with the concept of, having, of getting like the author ID of a book? So you, you say that author has many books, book has, it belongs to author. So there's a many, it's a one-to-many relationship. Right? So there's a collection of books on the author side. The book, if it's, if it's bidirectional, has a reference to its author. And of course, author book is probably more natural to be a many-to-many, -many, but let's, let's keep it simple by saying that uh, there's only ever one author for a book, and an author can write many books. So if you wanted to get the ID of the author for a given book, you could say book.author.id, right? But what about book.authorid with capital I? Are you guys all familiar with that? Can you? So I'm, I, I saw literally five hands. So the rest of you really don't know what this is, right? You've never used it? Part of the reason that you don't know this is, as bullet number two says, this is one of Grail's best kept secrets. <laughs> this is, I looked again today, this is not on the documentation. So the, the, and I didn't even know, I always called this the foo ID, because I, I didn't even know what it was called. But actually in, internally it's called the association ID. So why does this matter? This isn't a big deal. This is not a huge thing. This is not earth-shattering, change-your-life sort of stuff. But this is a performance optimization because if author is lazily loaded and it hasn't been initialized yet and all you need from it is the ID, then it's kind of crazy to load the entire author object from the database just to get its ID. When the way that you load the author from the database is you've got a lazily loaded, lazily initialized proxy object and the only data in this thing is the ID of the author so that you can then use it to go to the database and get it. So what you're doing is you're saying, somehow get the ID, go load the entire object back, and then now that you've got all that data, all those huge strings, all those huge objects, all that traffic across the network, now give me the ID that you had the whole time. Right? It's kind of crazy to do that. So wouldn't it be great if you could just use author ID to get the foreign key value and avoid that, not expensive, but it's one of those things where if you do this a lot in a loop or if you, if you scale and, and you start getting lots of traffic, then those little things that we take for granted, 
Locally, it runs fast. We have a small amount of, we have 100,000 records in the database, we have 1,000 records in the database, whatever. Locally, everything is super fast, everything's awesome. I check into the source control, CI build succeeds, ship it to production, and then <laughs> when it hits a million rows in the, in the production database, or 10 million, or a billion, then that little cost starts adding up. These little costs start adding up. So this broke recently. And it was ironically um, a, a colleague of mine, a, a, a guy that works at Agile Orbit, was the one who pointed that out. And uh, I'd, I'd seen this before. Actually, this is something I talk about in my book. Um, this, is, this is a very cool feature of Grails that I've, I've liked for a long time. And so I, I knew that I had seen it before, so I went to figure out, you know, where is this defined now? And a lot has changed in GORM recently, so I, I'm way behind the times. I'm, I haven't it, paid as much in, attention as I should have. So it took me longer than I um, <laughs> probably should have to find where, where this now hides. Um, but I was curious, you know, what broke and how do I fix it and how do, we, how do we sort of guard against this maybe breaking again in the future? So this is fixed. Graham fixed it in about five minutes. And, and uh, so it's fixed in uh, GORM 504, so a, a newer release of 3.1 uh, will fix it. And once 504 is out, then you can just manually upgrade to that. So this is not a, not a big, horrible, broken thing. But how does this work and, and how does it, why did it break? So, because they were asking, um, when it was fixed, they really weren't sure what did Graham do to actually fix this. I mean, because the fix wasn't, wasn't, wasn't clear what was going on. So it turned out that the problem was that um, in GORM, there's, uh, you can call it borrowed, you might call it stolen, there's the concept of the session, right? And the session factory in, in Hibernate. Um, there's the same concepts in GORM. And it's a really great pattern because by applying that same consistent model across all the different GORM implementations, you've got the same sort of session concept and criteria concept and all the same ideas that make so much sense in, hi sense in Hibernate but then become SQL for a relational database. Now we've got those, most of those same ideas, same class names, and same patterns in all the different GORMs. And some of the features are, are, are optional. Not every GORM has to implement every feature. Um, but if you can implement transactions, then you should. A lot of NoSQL data stores don't have the concept of transactions, so you just sort of fake it as best you can. And, but usually there's the concept of a, open a session, do some work in that session, and then close that session. And a session wraps a, a connection, and you don't, don't necessarily have a connection to the database. You might have a, you know, there's always some sort of a socket to a remote server somewhere. So that can be thought of, it can be wrapped up in, a, in that connection concept, in that session wrapper concept, in that... So there's not a session factory, it's a data store, but the data store is the, sort of the equivalent of the session factory. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of stuff goes through the data store APIs, but a lot of the, the Hibernate stuff goes through the Hibernate APIs. And there's a few places where they get out of sync, and that's, that's what happened. Um, so how do I get the ID? Because the problem, if we go back to this code right here, right? If I say book.author.id, as soon as I hit book.author, that's an immediate database call. That's going to trigger that lazy loading if it hasn't been initialized. It's not the .id that's going to actually cause the database load. It's, it's book.author. So it's sort of, I, th I always sort of think of it as it's like electric. You touch it and, you, and, it, and it you know, zaps you, or it's, or it's hot. You touch a stove and it burns your fingers. So as soon as you touch the author, you know, it's, 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 you've, you've cost that, that cost. So how do I do this without incurring that cost? And in order to do that, you've got to sort of you know, use some tricks and stuff. So there's this really cool class called the class property fetcher. It's a new thing, Lara Hotara wrote it a while ago. And it's really smart about being able to dig into properties using uh, uh, fields and property descriptors and sort of going around GORM and not touching the hot stuff, right? So going around it in a really safe way. So it, and it uses a caching mechanism so that you don't create a new one every time because it, it caches some lookups. So you get the property fetcher for the class, and that's probably going to give you one that was already created earlier on. And then that's going to give you the property value. So that's going to actually, the association in this case is the author. So now I've got this author object that I retrieved in a way that didn't initialize the object in the database. Step two is then, and this is my code. I'll show you the, the, the real Grails code in a bit. Because what I've done is I've, I've created a, a little bit of a, a little, I'm calling it Gorm Utils. I'm not really sure. Well, if that's the best name for it, but I, I've got a handful of stuff that I think is kind of shareable and reusable, so we, uh, we're going to release this uh, open source. And so this is, uh, this is 
a little bit lighter, more direct uh, route into that thing. This, this is, that's my code. Um, so, the, so the process is I need to get their author. I need to figure out what's the name of the ID. It's not necessarily ID, right? You know that it's ID. But what if Gorm doesn't, right? It can figure it out, but it's not necessarily ID. You can rename the ID property. You could have a composite ID. So if you just assume that the ID, the primary key pro uh, field property is called ID, then you can have some issues. This turns out <laughs> it was actually kind of fun to work on because that's kind of broken. So if you, the, the typical use case for this is, for example, if you have a string ID, maybe a UUID, uh, you can say in the mapping block, you can say ID name colon uh, username or UUID or something like that. So that, what that does is it tells Gorm, instead of using the, the property, the long ID property that all domain classes have, instead uses other property with this name as the ID for this. There's a little bit of a bug inside of Grails where it does that correctly, but there are, there's this concept of the persistent properties. So you guys, are you familiar with persistent properties? So when Grails starts up, when Gorm starts up, it's going to parse your domain classes and it's going to read all the properties and it's going to wire up all the stuff into Hibernate or into Redis or Mongo or whatever. And so there's all these objects, these metadata objects that represent concepts like, uh, uh, like the has many, right? So that's a, that's a, that represents a, a many to one relationship where you can have many to many. So there's, there's objects for all these things. And there are non-persistent properties and then there are persistent properties. So anything that's transient is, you know, it's kind of ignored. But you can get the list of, of property objects that describe the name, the uh, username, the height, the last access, to, you know, all those properties have these wrapper objects around them. It turns out that um, if you use a non-standard ID, the, the, there's a method on the domain class object that, where you get this stuff where, you can, where it will return the identity property and that will be wrong if you've misnamed them. So I've got a method that does all this stuff correctly so that you, you need a way to be able to find out what is the name of the ID. And most of the time it's going to be ID, but it could be anything. And then having gotten the, pro gotten the author, gotten the name of the ID property, now I've got to actually go in and get the ID. Now th and there's two paths there, right? If it's a proxy, I want to go to the proxy thing and that's a JavaSys proxy or something, and then I've got to know using the JavaSys API, how do I get in there to find that cached number if it's not initialized yet? And if it is initialized or it wasn't even a property at all, then just go direct. So, um, so there's this class called the proxy factory, and that's a thing that's aware of Hibernate proxying, or, and again, I, I keep saying Hibernate, but really, this is a generic GORM concept that all of the GORM implementations share. Any GORM can use proxying, can use lazy loading. This isn't a, something that, that Hibernate owns that only works in Hibernate. You can have lazy loading in any, any of the GORMs. So the proxy factory for Hibernate will be a JavaSys pro proxy factory. For the other GORMs will be a, a, you know, a different one that, that knows about how to do proxying in you know, Mongo or Redis. It will know if given an object, is it an instance of a proxy that I created, and if so, then I know where to go find the identifier. Otherwise, just go get it. And I can call it get property, and then that's, good. that's just a regular groovy thing. Get the property up by that name. So why did this break in Grails? I'm not going to go into all the details there, because this, I'm, I'm, I've, <laughs> I've gone a little bit too deep into this as it is. Um, but I, I do want to kind of write up a, a blog post on this, because it gets into something that I struggled with a bit um, a while ago, working on some other stuff that I'm going to be talking about a little bit later, um, the concept of the current session, right? So you guys know about the open session in view pattern where when we start a, a web request, we have a, a filter or an interceptor or something that um, opens up a session and stores it somewhere, right? There's this concept of binding it and storing it somewhere, making it thread local. And a lot of times when we talk about that, we sort of wave our hands and we say, we just put it somewhere that everyone knows where it is. And then later on, other code can go to that place and find it and then access it. And if it's there, they can use it. And if it's not, they can do their own. And we sort of wave our hands and say, you know, we just we put it out there somewhere. So what I want to kind of write about a little bit is, you know, where is that and how do we do this stuff? Because um, I spent hours in a debugger because um, the stuff I was working on was old Grails 1 code. 
and getting it working the way the new Grail stuff works um, was, was quite an interesting set of challenges. So um, the, the, the key problem was that there was a mismatch between the data store current session concept and the session factory current session. And as someone who doesn't work with it all the time, like I, like, like me, uh, it's really easy to get really confused about which session we're talking about. Is it hibernate session? Because there's actually, <laughs> there's actually these really funny layers where there's a data store session that wraps a hibernate session. So there's sessions on top of sessions, and it's, it, it gets, it gets kind of crazy. So ironically, it turned out that the, if, it was a, if it was an uninitialized, lazy loaded author thing, that worked fine because it went through the property uh, uh, proxy factory. It was only for the ones that were actually initialized, where there's no cost, where you can go direct. That's what actually broke. Um, so um, if this is the sort of thing you find interesting, uh, watch my Twitter, and you'll see I'll, I'll have this written up in, in a little while. We'll go into all the gory details of how this stuff works. All right, so I said at the very beginning that I solved two very uh, nagging issues. Again, this is not, this is not earth-shattering stuff. This is not um, the most amazing things ever. But these are things that have bothered me for such a long time. So six years ago, long, long time ago, first time my my first conference actually uh, I was at Spring One, and I did a talk. Uh, the, the, you can't really see it, but that, there's a hyperlink there to click through to it. And it's on um, the unexpected performance cost of uh, using collections inside of Grails. Right. So we have this. You know, author has many books. Books is a collection. It's a, it's a set. It can be a list if we want it to. We can actually make it a bag so it doesn't even have a, a type, so it's not guaranteed to be ordered or, or unique. And it's a pretty cool concept, right? Because either it's uninitialized because we don't need it yet, or if we do need it, then we go to the database and we populate that collection. That sounds cool, and it's great for an author has many books because authors don't have that many books. If an author has two or five or... 50 books, then getting all 50 books from the database just to access the, fir the last three most recent is not a big deal. But where I saw, saw some pretty significant problems was where, uh, in a large project, where the, it was um, a many-to-many -many with users and roles. And a user will have one, two, three, maybe five roles. But a role will have all the users. Role user, if you have one, call that. Probably, have, probably every user in your database has role user. So to get the roles users collection is crazy expensive. So I was really kind of concerned about this. Um, we had some significant performance problems at, a, at, a, at the company I was consulting at. And so when I reworked the Spring Security plugin, I made sure that I used that pattern in the plugin. So if you use the Spring Security pl core plugin and you do their standard um, user role, you know, you call it whatever you like, person, authority, whatever. Instead of saying person has many roles and role has many users or whatever, there's that explicitly, there's that user role join class. So there's three domain classes, which you don't have to do in regular Grails, which is kind of cool because Grails takes care of that for you. It creates the third table and it maps everything for you and it's, it's Grailsy. It's, it's, it's convenient. It's, we don't have to worry about it. It's a, it's a, it's a classic Grails pattern. But it's too grailsy, right? It's, there's, there's that hidden potential uh, performance cost under the hood um, that, for the most part, to be honest, is not a big deal. You know, upwards of a, th a few thousand objects is not that expensive to load in from the database. It's only when it gets really big or if you do it quite a lot that, that it's really bad. So regardless, I use this pattern as much as I can. But the class that you end up getting, you've probably seen it. It's, it's pretty huge. It goes on and on and on. It's got all this boilerplate stuff. You've got a, it's got, it's its own primary key, which is kind of a strange concept. So that means a whole bunch of weird things. And luckily the class encapsulates it and you don't have to deal with the details, but it has to be serializable. It has to implement uh, well-defined hash code and equals. Um, in order, Gorm doesn't really understand how it works. So the finders sort of, the dynamic finders work, but doing something simple like just finding if, if there's already an instance uh, in there or creating a new instance is kind of clumsy. So it's got a bunch of static methods in there that do all that work for you. And that's great. Problem solved. If you, if you need that, you use it. And if you have another use case for something just like that, you can just copy my class that I generated for you with a script and rename everything and, and reuse it. 
And that's what happened is I was working on a project where um, they were, there were many of these, many of the many's, and there were so many of these nearly identical classes. And whenever I see duplicated code like that, it really bugs me because I want to put it to a base class or use an AST or do something to get rid of all that nearly duplicate code. Um, because I, you know, if you need to change something, if you, change, if you have to change it in 10 places, that's really annoying because what if you miss one? If you can change it in one place, that's obviously much better. So I had struggled with this. I tried to use ASTs, and I, you know, I just spent a long time with it. And traits came to the rescue. Traits are frickin' awesome. You guys, are you using traits yet in your, in your code? They are amazing. It's the coolest thing added to Groovy just about ever. It's, <laughs> I could just gush for two straight hours on this stuff. I'm using them everywhere. I did an audit logging thing using traits. I created this many to many with it. Um, uh, I redid, I reworked uh, the solar plugin, you know, the replacement for uh, searchable. So um, using traits, and I, I've just gone crazy with traits. So I was thinking that, because I didn't have luck with ASTs for various reasons, and I was actually talking to Jeff Brown earlier today, and <laughs> we kind of realized as I was saying it out loud that I think I might have just done it wrong, and I probably could have done this years ago with an AST, but. Oh well. Um, so I now have a trait that I'm not going to show you because it, it's huge and obnoxious, but that does exactly what I wanted it to do. But what I will show you is how it's used. So the package name with this will probably change. This will probably be com.agileorbit or something, but right now this is in my namespace. It's up on the Agile Orbit website, actually, on GitHub. So if you have a user role, and again, this is the, the name of the thing doesn't matter, but you've got a uh, one side and the other side, and one of them's the owner, and the other one's the thing that's owned. And so you implement the the trait. That's how we implement. That's how we use traits. We sort of think of them think of them kind of like interfaces, even though they're kind of not. They're really mix-ins. But you implement the trait, and I set it up so that it's generic. So you have to tell me what's the left property type and what's the right property type, and then also because it made life easier for me, you have to tell me redundantly. What is this type, the type that this is applied to? And given that information, all I need you to do is create those properties. You can name them whatever you want, because I'm going to figure that out. But the types have to agree. And then I, I could do the mapping. I could program, programmatically go in there and insert those two uh, rows into the mapping block. Uh, but, that's, but that's kind of obnoxious, and that would have been a lot of work, because they've got to merge that in with stuff that you might have already done yourself, and that's programmatically challenging. Because what I really wanted to do was have you as the user, me as the user, have to do the smallest amount of work, smallest amount of typing, to get all that same behavior. And so this is more than I was hoping to have to do, but it's a lot less than, than the alternative. Um, so this is, I think, so much better than this, and this, and this, right? So that's the current class that gets generated by the Spring Security um, Quick start script. So you've got the um, the properties, a constructor equals and hash code. It's got to be serializable. Uh, you've got to have a method for getting in one instance, checking if an instance exists, creating a new instance, removing one, removing all roles for a given user, removing all users for a given role, all that junk. Now that's this. And I don't have to use that tiny little font that makes the code unreadable. This is awesome. I, this, I, I'm, I'm sure there's no one in this room who's exci as excited as I am. But this is awesome. When I finally did this, I was like, yay, it's me. I'm awesome. I did this thing. Because so, this really, this has been nagging at me forever. And it's not a big deal. But it's just when, something, when you have an itch that itches for years, and you finally scratch it and it goes away, and life is good. So um, this is going to be in that Gorm Util uh, library. The, the, code will be, the code is available right now. I'll give you the address for that later. It's on GitHub. I'm actually going to release it as a, as a library, my first non-plugin uh, library out there. It's got some utility methods and some stuff like this. And it's, it's also got another super cool thing. So, Gorm Util. Another thing that bugs me as a Hibernate user and as someone who spends a lot more time using relational databases than NoSQL non-relational databases is I look at a lot of SQL. I turn on SQL logging all the time. When I'm doing complex queries, when I'm concerned about performance, you know, even, if I, even if I don't have a, a real 
a lot of concerns about, you know, how do I create this query? But I'm worried about, is this the most uh, efficient query that I could be running? I'm looking at SQL all the time. And y you guys have seen Hibernate SQL, right? They create um, guaranteed unique aliases for every column and all the table names so that um, for really complex, because you can join into a, t into a table multiple times. So you can't just pick an alias and reuse it because then you'll have, you, you, you know, it has to be unique. What you end up with then is unreadable stuff. You get select from where and you know I, I, you kind of learn to see around that, but wouldn't it be nice if you didn't have to? So what if you didn't have to see all those aliases? What if you can say select uh, u.id, comma u.version, comma u.name, comma whatever from user u, where? But even more so, what if you want to see the 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 what goes in with the question marks, right? Now there are some libraries out there where you can use tricks like um, a custom data source that creates a wrapper connection, that creates wrapper uh, statements, that create wrapper result sets that um, are on top of the real classes and then intercept that and then capture the stuff and do all these things. And those are great. They're typically a very high performance. Uh, uh, P6Spy is one of them. And they just went away, they went away for years and years and they just redid their whole thing and they, uh, they did a whole new 2.0 version. And I actually updated the plugin recently. I created the P6Spy UI plugin. Um, but that's, I think, kind of invasive because you've got to replace your data source and you've got to do all this stuff. And I, I don't think there's really any performance concerns, but it's, it's, it's a lot of work and, and um, it's, it's kind of fidgety. So what I would prefer is something more lightweight. So the way that this works is that it actually registers as a listener for the logging statements. So it's probably less efficient than doing the other approach, but it's a little, uh, it's a little, I think it makes more sense. It's more intuitive for me. So because the way that you can do SQL logging, there's two approaches. You can turn on, you can say log SQL equals true, or you can use uh, log4j um, or log back or whatever. The problem with log SQL equals true is that that just dumps everything into the console. And then you can't really do anything with that. You're just going to fill up your Catalina out file and it's going to blow up and become really huge. If you do the alternate though and you use logging, it's going to write the, it uses the org.hibernate.sql logger name. So you can use that and print that to the console if you want. Or you can write it to its own file and you can have that be a rolling file or whatever and you have a lot more flexibility there. So using the logging uh, stuff is, it makes a lot more sense. And then in addition, what you can't get with log equals, equals true is the, is the values, the question mark placeholder values. And that's e a little bit different, and so there's a lot of stuff you've got to do there. So I've done two things. I have the SQL Cleaner class that gets rid of all the aliases and makes, for me, readable SQL with question marks. And then there's like six or seven classes, I can spend a little bit of time talking about this stuff, that are involved in creating a, a custom appender. So I've got an appender that works with uh, log4j and one that works, and logback at, at the same time. So it, it, it's uh, dynamic Ruby, it's compile static everywhere that I can make it compile static. And then in a very few places it's dynamic because the APIs turn out, because the guy same guy wrote them, to be very similar between logback and log4j. Um, and I just need to basically leave off the class names and the package names. And, used in it, and so Groovy comes to the rescue and lets me uh, do things very conveniently. So this will be in there, and I can actually do a super quick demo of that, actually. So what you do when you use this is you register a callback. So there's going to be sort of like an event for every SQL statement. And you register a callback, and it's going to give you this stuff, and then you can do with it what you like. So it doesn't just dump it to the console or write it to a log, logging. You can, you, can, you can do whatever you like. So, um, <coughs> so what I'm doing here is I'm printing more than I normally would because I, I, I found a bug this morning and I was, I was working on some stuff. So um, this is the, what I really want. This is the solution to my problem. I can't, my mouse is just not working for me today. But um, so this line here, the, the lines that aren't indented are the cleaned, um, 
And so, so this, every one of these in brackets is, is a replaced value. So, th and this is the original stuff. So this is what you normally have to deal with, and this is the cool new stuff. Now, it's not as bad here as it is for queries because it's an insert. But if you then do some querying, like based on the <coughs> stuff I was doing at the very beginning there, then you see a little bit more noise. Now you see the problem that I was, okay, thank you. Now you see the problem that I was talking about. So you've got this, um, that's a clean one, so that's a good one, so we've got to look down here. So we've got all those ugly aliases, manager 312, depart, depart me 320, all this stuff, and question marks, and all this crap. And then in order to get this, you've got to get the SQL plus all, every single binding statement. You've got to merge all this stuff together. But, and I can filter this out. I'm, I'm only showing this for debugging purposes. This is what I would normally see. And this is, a, do we like this? Is this good? <laughs> so this will be available very soon. Um, all right. So I've got the many-to-many -many trait. There's another domain class trait that's sort of like a base trait that's got a bunch of handy utility methods in it that, that it extends and some other stuff extends. Another thing that I did that, it, this is not a big deal, but one of the things that's slightly artificial with Grails is um, like with transaction, with session, uh, with new session, um, all those methods are on, are static methods on every uh, domain class, but they don't have anything to do with that domain class. Person.with transaction functions exactly the same as role.with transaction. Person.execute query. Um, so what I always thought would, it would have been good it would have been to have some sort of this like god object, this say gorm dot with transaction. And I, it's, it's silly, um, but I, I just think it's a little bit more honest. That you're not saying, you're not sort of implying that this transaction has anything to do with the person class or the dog class or the department class or anything. It's just running a transaction right here or with session or something. So it's also got flush and clear so that you can flush the current session and clear the current session and stuff like that. Uh, Gorm Utils is a utility class. It's got a bunch of um, stuff that I find myself copy pasting a lot. And what the problem, what, what this is really here for is, I am I have all this stuff on my hard drive, all these little projects and classes and things that I just bring with me everywhere I go. And when I'm creating test apps and when I'm doing debugging and stuff, I am like, well, I, yeah, I should use that SQL cleaning stuff. And then I could use this and do this. And usually I don't check it in because it's not, it's you know helper stuff. But it would be nice if I could just have a dependency on some library and then it just was always there and I didn't have to do all this stupid copy-paste. So um, another thing that, that uh, is actually kind of cool is it's got a, a little bit smarter finder save where. So the Grails finder save where is a little bit frustrating because, for example, if I want to do a uh, you know, like person dot find or save where, right? It's actually pretty cool. It's finder create where. So it goes to the database and gets it if it's there. And if it doesn't, then it creates a new instance, but it doesn't save it. And then there's finder save, which uh, finds or saves, right? It does what it says on the tin. Um, so I could say username Bert. Um, and that's, that's good, right? Except that um, there's probably 10 other properties in that class that are not nullable that I've got to include but some of them might be not specifiable. So I've got to, in order for this to really to work, I've got to say password, whatever, and height, whatever, and all this other stuff. But what I really want to, and some of this might not be specifiable. For example, with bcrypt, yeah. y when you crypt the, uh, a, a clear text password, twice with bcrypt, it's always going to be a different hash, always. But the, they're equivalent. So the algorithm knows, given two hashes, are they equivalent to the same clear text original stuff? Because it uses itself as, a, as its own salt, and it's got this, it's kind of complicated. So I can't actually even use that, because if I say password, clear text password, and then hash it, that's guaranteed to not be the value that's in the database. So just for, for the, if, if, if I only had two required properties, this whole pattern fails. Because yes, I can find the row with username Bert, but I can't find the one that has Bert and that password. So in order to do this, I've got to do it in two steps. Now I've got to, I can't say find or save where. I've got to say 
find by username and then set, 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 if it, you know, all the stuff, it's gonna be multi, um, multi-pass. So what I did was this. This is something sh that should actually be in Grails, I think. Something like that, right? So it's actually two sets. The stuff you use for the finder, and then if you didn't find it, the extra stuff that you would set if you, uh, if you need to. A little bit smarter. Um, wrapping up, wrapping up. And um, another thing is uh, table sorter. So if you wanted to delete a bunch of data, but you've got foreign keys, you've got to know that I would delete these first before I can delete these. But I've seen in a couple of uh, libraries, more like GUI libraries that aren't really usable externally, you can sort your tables by foreign key. You can figure out based on your uh, relationships that I've got to clear this table first and then this table, and, and then there's a bunch that don't matter, the order doesn't matter. But you can set up a, an ordering, you know, a non-unique ordering, where you can insert in the right order or delete in the right order. So it says it's got a table sorter class that'll just give, an, you just give it a connection and it uses the JDBC metadata API. You don't, even, you don't give it table names or anything like that, you just point it at your schema and say, give me the list of ordered table names. And it won't necessarily be the same list every time, but it'll always be the right order for, for how things work. And more, I mean, we're gonna keep adding to this as, as we get stuff. May accept some external contributions, but um, I don't necessarily want this to be like a community pile on where everyone puts everything in cool that they've ever done with GORM and we just put it into this gigantic library because I don't want this to become a, a, an alternate GORM because GORM is pretty awesome as it is. This is, should be just uh, uh, some small helper stuff that um, will you know, make our lives a little bit easier. So the quote is actually up there right now. It was a private repo until this morning <laughs> and uh, we just, I just got Bobby Warner to uh, make this public today. So the code's out there. You can, uh, I'll put the slides up on SlideShare and tweet that so you can have the links and everything. And we'll do a, I gotta do some cleanup, gotta name, rename some packages and stuff. And so we'll do a release, uh, a snapshot release. And so some real quick things. So um, I did some, again, like I was saying, a lot of this is based on client work. So I, I do not have permission to release a lot of the work that I've been doing. But I think I, I, think I can get it. So, uh, cause a lot of the stuff doesn't have anything to do with their core business. So they don't lose money, they don't lose competitive, uh, you know, uh, they, th their competitors aren't gonna benefit from, you know, my multi-tenant stuff that I did for this, you know, social app that we, we worked on. So multi-tenancy is, is something that's kind of painful to do and there's not a lot of great solutions out there. So I reworked multi-tenant core and Falco and Util, which is, doesn't work at all with Grails 2, and um, that's the one I was talking about where I struggled a lot with the current session concept. And that's where I kind of really kind of crystallized a lot of this stuff and lear relearned it again. So, um, yes. Um, so look for some of this stuff. So there'll be some audit logging stuff, multi-tenancy. There is a multi-tenant plugin, but it's really lightweight. It's got some nice functionality, but it's not aggressive enough. And, and um, it's really just to partition into tenants, but it doesn't keep you from inserting data into the wrong tenants, whereas this one is, it'll roll back changes and stuff. It's really aggressive. Um, so we're gonna open source this stuff. We're gonna update it for Grails 3X and Grails data mapping 5X. And, and like I always say, uh, even though it's now three years old and, and uh, getting less and less valid, uh, I did write a book, you should have it, and um, buy extra copies so that you can give them to your mom for Christmas. They make great stocking stuffers. Uh, gracias for your... Four feet to the